just give her a second. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. How are you? Oh, it's, it's such a pleasure to see you, truly. Like, we had such a good conversation yeah. last week, and I am just so glad to talk to you. And I am very grateful that you're going to help me with version number two of the FPI's handbook because I think it's time to update to it. So, uh, thank you. I'm very excited for it to come out. Uh, that book has helped me in so many ways. And, oh, gosh. You know, I think it's helped a lot of people with their FPI's journey. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm very yeah. excited. And that's that's the plan. I think we just we need to add to it as the medical information comes out. We need to add uh, to what's known so that we keep it as real and as up to date as we can. And absolutely, <laughs> just thank you, thank you for being you, and thank you for um, the way that you're contributing to FPIs. Because I, I feel like we're all in this together. I when we have these situations happen to us, which are really scary. Um, we just, we need to be there for each other. What better thing to unify us than adversity? Absolutely. You know, we're, we're basically a, a family with all the F5 and food allergy parents. Like, yes. we all have to connect and find <laughs> a way because I feel like this journey is so lonely and scary that it's nice to have people around to support you. Yeah, I, they did a study like years ago that um, having a child with F5 is one of the most stressful things that a parent can experience. And it was especially was, I think, stressful because for the longest time, like it's been a, a known clinical entity for probably centuries. Mm -hmm. And it's only recently that people are realizing that it's, it's a real condition. And for the longest time, there wasn't like a good guide or a good manual to tell you what to do and how to, to improve your situation. And it's just, it's so important that we decrease each other's stress because we already have enough stress just taking care of babies, right? Like, like just, just having a Absolutely. child, having a toddler is stressful enough. Why add to that stress? Especially if there's something that can help. And you know, yeah, that's, definitely. that's, that's my goal. And I, I think it's your goal too, just, just to try to be, 100%. Be that change. I also just wanted to give a disclaimer. If I look distracted or anything, I have a very sick toddler oh today, gosh. and she is not a happy camper. So uh, uh, she's I feel like needing me to wipe her nose and be coughing. So oh my I goodness! <laughs> I know. Oh. I hope everything winds up being okay. I truly do. And and look at you. Like you're you're spending this time uh, doing a live a video as opposed to. I know, taking care of your child and that just that means so much to me thank, thank you <laughs> thank you <laughs> <laughs> okay so uh, I have some questions written down um, if you just want to give a quick intro about yourself and your background uh, just for anyone who doesn't know okay. of course thank you so um, Gosh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a family physician, which means I see everybody. Um, and I, I, I'm in New Jersey. Uh, uh, I'm dating myself here, but I've been practicing clinical medicine for about um, 15 years. Uh, I think prior to my ch having my child, I was work I worked a lot. <laughs> I, was, I was a little bit of a workaholic. So I ran an urgent care center and I saw patients in the uh, family medicine office, everybody. And um, I also did um, house calls. And then you have a child who has this medical condition at FIs, and everything changes in your life because your priority always should be your children, your child. And so for a while, I was in the trenches with many of you. And my daughter now is five years old. Yay, five years old. Yay. <laughs> and um she outgrew like her, her 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 all of the stuff that she had and i remember at one point all we had was elemental formula and all these feeding challenges and and now now she's fine but but being in the trenches like you have no idea because the studies tell you, the studies vary from geographic location to geographic location. So one study might say that your child will outgrow it when they're 18 months old. And the other one will say, oh, it'll be when they're four or five. And so because yeah. of that, you just, you don't know for your child when they're going to outgrow it. And there's 
so, especially with some of these common food triggers, there's so many foods that if you go out and you buy foods that, you, that aren't like ready-made, uh, that are ready-made that you'll make yourself, like they have the triggers. And so it changes your life because you have to be so careful and cautious with what, what you give your child. Yeah, and I think too, when you're in the midst of it, even hearing stories of other kids growing out of it, it almost seems like that's not going to happen to you. Yeah. Like it seems like it's an impossible um, thing that will happen in the future, but you know, it, it does really take time, but uh, it's definitely something that's hard to kind of comprehend at the time. It is. I think some of us have this natural tendency, I don't think everybody, but some of us have this natural tendency to say, well... I, it's, I'm going to have the worst case or, or it's, it's going to be worse for me and I'm not going to be an average. No, no, no. If this is going to be my child, going to have many more food triggers. Um, it's, it's easy when you're scared to almost catastrophize. And so the Absolutely. average child has three or fewer true reactions to three or, few, three or few, fewer foods to which they really have a reaction. But you don't know that going in. You don't know if you're going to be average or, or if you're going to be somebody who's going to have, have more, more triggers. And, 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 and then it make, becomes frightening to try the different foods because you don't know um, which ones will give you the reaction, which ones won't. Although, like in my book, I researched all of it and like, oh gosh, I read like a thousand research articles. It was like crazy. And because, <laughs> yeah, you're just, you're so trying so much to advocate for your child and then you're trying so much to advocate for other children as well. And you realize that there's certain connections. That if your child has a reaction to a particular food in a particular food family, more likely than not, the reactions are going to happen to other foods within the same food family because they share similar uh, protein structures. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah I think we had like 25 triggers, mm -hmm. and we are down now to three or four. Yes. And she's just about three, so. Yeah, and, and and I I still feel you with that because when you you're you, when you are when you have so many triggers, and we have we have a huge list too. Um, when you have so many triggers, you wind up being on elemental formula often, mm -hmm. and it becomes a like like a catch twenty two situation where you're, you're it's scary to try new foods. But you know you have to try new foods because there are developmental windows. And it's like there's you, you're, you need to expose your child to odor or motor stuff, to like different skills within their mouth, to where they learn how to chew, where they learn how to swallow, like like the, the development of the mouth and the development of the teeth there and the muscle coordination there should ideally coincide with with introductions of new foods. Mm -hmm. And that includes different tastes and different textures and different smells. And when you have so many potential triggers, it you have to get creative with how you introduce the taste, the smells, the textures, and all that. Yeah. Absolutely, especially when you're so limited with foods, you kind of have to become like a chef and <laughs> Oh gosh, you know, yeah. Make up random recipes. Yeah, yeah, and there's no good recipe book about advice. That's that's another goal for me in the future. Oh, you're so good with your child. Um, there's so like that's another goal for me in the future. Like I'm I'm hoping that after we do the second second edit, the second version of the advice handbook, that we do a um a recipe book for for all of us. Because that would other, be great. I think that would be really exciting. Yeah. So if anyone's listening and they have some good recipes to share, let us know. Because I think it's I think we need to have a book just for us so that we get those tastes and those textures in there to to um to keep up with the developmental windows that we have at, uh, during those yeah. you know early on. I think there would be some really 
crazy recipes. Like just thinking of some of the <laughs> oh my food that yeah. she ate. Like she was that kid, you know, who would have instead of you know like a like a regular snack or whatever, she'd be eating a bowl of ground lamb for a snack before bed. Yes. Like, <laughs> <laughs> lamb, yum. <laughs> oh my yeah. god. And I'm like, oh my goodness, like this is not like appetizing. She's just going, you know, on the bowl lamb, but. Yeah, you gotta do what you gotta do, right? You gotta do it. Yeah, you do. Um, so for the first birthday, like there's always this dream of having this amazing birthday cake for your child, right? Like everyone thinks when your child turns one, like you're gonna have this. Um, you're gonna really celebrate that birthday. Look at all the milestones that happened uh, by the time your child became one, and so you think, oh, you're gonna have this great birthday cake, and then you realize that. You know, your child doesn't care about the birthday cake. It's, it's, it's in your head. But you still want to have a birthday cake of some sort. And yeah, I remember... Exactly. Like, that was such a huge moment for us, too. Like, uh, it was almost a grieving period for me that, oh, she wouldn't have this cake. And then, I mean, yeah. we had her birthday party, and, you know, they're, they're babies. They have no idea that yeah. there should even be anything. They don't <laughs> care. Know, it's more <laughs> just a, a cultural thing, I guess, to put so much emphasis on, like, this food. Yes, as being part of this massive uh, celebration, or it could be a massive celebration. It doesn't have to be for everybody, but for some cultures, it's like that one, like that the, the first birthday party seem, seems to be a big deal. And I remember for our first day, birthday party, by that time, she was okay with coconut. Yay! So we made one ingredient coconut cake. No way. Yeah, <laughs> it was like nothing but coconut. <laughs> and it, it looked like a cake, which is awesome. We were like so happy. Like, look at a cake. It took forever to make. It took hours and hours. Uh, but it was it was a coconut cake. And then you add, to, but then you taste it, and the only thing you taste is coconut, <laughs> because after all, <laughs> the only ingredient is is coconut. Mm -hmm. So, so that makes it harder. Yeah, for sure. It definitely shows though how creative you can get with that with only few ingredients. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you you have to be. Um, but but you try because it's your child. Um, it's also kind of I think interesting, and I don't know if all FPI's parents have to go through this, but your child becomes your world, and taking care of a chronic medical condition like this um, can. Like it, it, it takes away so much from everything else that you're doing, right? It just it, it becomes more, more encompassing, and so you really, I think, parents of children with F pies or with other food allergies, you 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 truly have to learn how to have an incredible, um, like incredible love for your child. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, someone just commented, will this be saved as a highlight? Yes, it will. We will have the saves on both of our Instagrams so you can watch it at any time. Exactly. Um, and do you have any questions? Because we, we want to, like we have, we, I, th I think we'll, we'll just, we'll have a conversation. I will keep it real because I think that's so important. But do you have any particular questions? Aw, of course. Thank you. Someone just said thanks so much. And uh, no, thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs> That's important. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I have some other questions written down as well. Um, is there anything specific that you know of that can cause that rise? Oh, gosh. <laughs> it's, it's such a little know, question. That's a tough one. And I, yeah, I asked that, and I'm like, I have no idea how to answer that question. Yeah, because it's such a it's such a nuanced question. I think I think is the answer. And um, I think part of it also is that there's so much that we think we know, but you know, a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, some physicians used to do bloodletting thinking that bloodletting was like the cure for a fever, and we definitely know it's not. So based upon what we know so far, we can make certain uh, certain assumptions. And um, one of those assumptions 
is that uh, most likely it's due to some kind of protein in the food that uh, triggers an inflammatory response within the immune system okay. uh, that uh, activates certain uh, uh, well, immune cells. Uh, and that cascade forward, you get things like serotonin involved. Serotonin is a hormone that um, is found in the gut and it moves its way all the way to the brain. And when it moves its way to the brain, um, it can uh, trigger in some of these receptors in the brain, it can trigger uh, a vomiting and, okay. and nausea. Um, and so that's part of it. It's it's like this this whole biological response. Now, we do also think that there are children who have F pies who have a different composition of microorganisms in their digestive tracts. And it's kind of really interesting this this brain gut connection because um, F pies is not the only place where you find that you can also find that like like i'm writing another book um because my baby had colic i don't know if any of your babies have colic sometimes f pies and some of the crying that you have with f pies can mimic colic colic is where you cry and cry and cry and cry and cry these these ear piercing painful cries for hours a day uh most days of the week uh for for a long time and in that condition as well, uh, there can be some changes to the gut microbiome. So, gosh, I'm 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 looking at FIs, but I'm looking at other medical conditions that um, mimic it as well. And I'm, I'm writing books about those, just because I think we we, okay, really we need to be there for each other, right? <laughs> and and figure yeah. this all out. Um. So so probiotics may or may not help. And it's really interesting. Like some people will say, oh, take the probiotics. But you have, everything's so nuanced. There's no perfect answer. It's like, uh, what is art? And everyone's going to give you a different answer when it comes to art. So can probiotics help? Sure. Could they potentially do some harm? Maybe. So an example would be um, there are people who have a reaction to uh, Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a type of probiotic. It's found in some of the probiotic supplements that you get. And okay. um, that one, there's been, like rare, it's really, really rare, but there's been clinical literature to show that that particular probiotic can actually trigger a reaction. So, so okay, it's so it, it, something you got to be careful with. Yes, yeah, so with, with the Saccharomyces boulardii, but not all of the probiotics have that. The other thing I would caution people against is maybe taking some of the prebiotics, especially when you have a baby baby, um, because uh, the pre prebiotics are food for the probiotics. So your probiotics are the organisms that live in your digestive tract. If you think about it, like we look at our bodies, we're like, oh, there's our bodies, it's us. But so much of who we are is actually our microorganisms and the bacteria that live everywhere in our bodies, including in our digestive tract, and do so much of our digestion for us. They create some of our hormones for us. And um, those probiotics get food from prebiotics. The problem with prebiotics is that sometimes they allow, especially when the baby's young, um, they can allow some of the Work, bad, there's good bacteria and there's bad, bad, bad bacteria in quotation marks. Sometimes the prebiotics allow more of the bad bacteria to grow. And that, that's not going to okay. help you. So um, usually I just enjoy probiotics by, by themselves. Okay, yeah, we, uh, we were recommended to try it when she was little. We ended up trying the BioGaia uh -huh. uh, probiotics. And thankfully, she like one of the ingredients is sunflower lecithin. So we pass sunflower, which is good. And I think that's another issue, right? Sometimes the extra ingredients people can react to, but we yeah. work with that. And I did find it helpful, I think. But I mean, it's so hard to really tell. Like, I think it, it gave me a peace of mind more than anything, just to feel like I was doing something. Uh, of course. 
And I, I think, and it's also kind of exciting, right? Like, like celebrate your wins, uh, even the tiny ones, because I think sometimes when, when we have heartache and we get fear, even if there's a tiny win that you have, why not celebrate it, right? Because we need that. We need that. We, we need to, to celebrate those so that we somehow find gratitude in things that are hard. Absolutely. Um, okay, let me see. There's another question. Uh, how rare is it to actually, uh, actually for bath to react to breast milk? I brought up to my pediatrician that I felt his poo was still mucusy, even though we cut out solids for a week for gut rest. She wasn't worried. Ah, so I'm hoping over time more and more pediatricians know about FPIs and more of the family doctors um, know about FPIs too, because um, pediatricians are not the only ones who see children, so are family doctors as I'm, an example of that. And uh, that's a really hard question to answer, and there's a couple of reasons for it. Um, and again, it's nuance. The first one is that some babies, no matter what you try, they're just going to have these abnormal poops. Just the way it is. Um, there's there's guide there's baselines for 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 stool right and for reactions. But those baselines are based upon where most babies fall. You have outliers in either direction, and sometimes those that what seems like an outlier because it's a it's a it's a disease like FPIs actually, or like uh, proctocolitis actually is um, just an outlier. Second, sometimes it takes babies a while to stop reacting. So you, you would think that it's uh, after a week, everything will be fine, but it can take many weeks for the reaction to completely go away. Uh, because it takes a while just 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 for things to heal for for the for the digestive tract to heal um and then how how common is it to react to foods and breast milk and so in my book just because i've talked to so many families who have fis um i there's there's a number of families who swear that their baby developed fis or, or, or proctocolitis from breast milk because that was the only thing they were they were being fed and um, there's literature it's scientific literature that's finally coming out that's, that's showing that yes there are certain foods in breast milk that can trigger a reaction um, uh, just because tiny amounts of a protein um, or tiny amounts of that food can can get, get into um, uh, the the baby. Uncommon, yeah, but it happens. Uh, that happened to us as well with the breast milk. Uh, I was breastfeeding. They suggested it was cow's milk protein allergy originally. Mm. So I cut out dairy, soy, and she was still reacting, still reacting, and I could not figure it out. Um, so then eventually, you know, long story short, we had to switch to Neocate and the elemental formula. But now that I go back and I see... I was eating, like, I, I have celiac, so I'm gluten-free. So I was eating a lot of corn-based foods, and it was a FPI's reaction to corn. Yeah. So I never would have figured that out with the breast milk. It was, it was that it was corn triggered it. Like, I was at the point, you know, I wasn't really eating anything, uh, except for sometimes I would have, like, my, my corn pasta play, and uh, that's, that's what I figured out was causing it. It's, it's so hard because some of the – Foods that are most commonly associated with the development of FIs are the foods that are most commonly in our diets. Mm -hmm. It's crazy how many foods have corn or, or corn derivatives. Just like it's crazy how many foods, yeah. like an example is rice, right? Like it's crazy how many foods have, have rice or, or milk or soy. And, yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's just, it's, 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 it's hard and you really have to read product labels. Like, and it's frustrating sometimes for me. And I don't know if you've had this experience where you read a product label, you think you're good. And then you read the product label a week later and some ingredient has changed and you have no idea. Like, like <laughs> unless you read the product label, you're, you're, you're just not going to know that. Yeah, I think that F5 and food allergy parents have more research skills than the FBI sometimes looking into Yes! <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, it's it's in, it's incredible. I think that um, having a child with a rare medical condition, for like for me at least, it made me truly realize what it is to love, right? Mm -hmm. To truly love, because part of loving is being selfless, and 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 especially with your child, and and putting their needs. Um, making their needs important while while you also try to practice some self care. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And um, I think this also teaches us a lot about who who we are as people. Like sometimes those the toughest moments in our lives are the ones that that teach us the most about who who we are, um, and and how we react to stress. Um, and um, it's just it's it's beautiful that we we get to grow as as we experience our challenges. Definitely. Uh, next question. Uh, <laughs> next okay. question. Okay. Do you think that your medical background prepares you for advice? I know there's not a lot that you know, not a lot of medical professionals have even heard of this. Do you yeah. think that you were prepared? I think that I was in the trenches with all of you. So uh, when we started with our journey, there was no um, international consensus guidelines, and it took forever to see the doctors. And I feel like I, I knew a lot as a, as a physician. I think one of the things I learned is um, to trust my gut, because in years and years and years of clinical practice you you learn to to trust your gut but i think the thing that pre that uh, prepared me the most was being thrown into other medical situations where you have to figure it out and you don't have a choice and it's either sink or swim so an example is I was in the hospital one night as a medical resident, and I have no idea. I, like, I always learned how to intubate, and I learned how to intubate on a mannequin, right? It, but then you're thrown into the situation, and you have to intubate, or that person's going to die. And you have to figure out how to do it. And you're, like, terrified, and you're shaking inside, but you cannot share that with anybody because then the family's going to be, like, freaked out. Like, who, who are you? You look like you're 12, and here you are. You better know what you're doing <laughs> when you're intubating. And and you just you, 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 you figure it out, and you take that moment to become uh, – to to, to, to – to experience your fear and do it anyway and do the best you can any, anyway and um, constantly be learning. And I think that approach, I think for all of us to constantly be learning um, is, is helpful. Um, I think it also helped that I have, gosh, I have too many degrees under my belt. I'm a never ending student. And so um, I got a master's degree in epidemiology and biostatistics. And that allows me to look critically at research papers. And so um, being able to just read all of the literature, I think, was really helpful. And to look at it yeah, critically. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, do you have any advice um, for FI families about talking to their medical professionals uh, about FI? Oh, oh gosh, so not everyone's going to know about it. I'm trying to change it. I'm trying to change our knowledge base. And I'm not the only one who's trying to change it. There's organizations out there who, who are trying to do the same thing and just advocate and advocate. So I'm constantly in the uh, medical support groups because we have these support groups for physicians um, talking about FIs, spreading awareness about it. But that doesn't mean that your doctor is going to know about it or is not or is going to know a lot. And in those cases, and this sounds terrible, but sometimes you need to be that person who introduces your doctor to it. And the ways to do that is you, you bring them the clinical literature, sometimes you bring them a book, right? Like the FI's handbook, or or you bring them the international consensus guidelines, or you bring them literature to show that you're just this is not just your opinion right this is this is this is what the literature shows and this is what needs to be done 
one of the things that sometimes worries me about doctors is not all of them will prescribe Zofran to you, and some of them require to, you to be seen. And yet, right now, I think with COVID, sometimes it's stressful to go to a hospital because you're there, you want, you need the Zofran for your child, you need to evaluate things, um, but you could be exposed to a virus. And it's not like most children because of the age group where that's most likely to have FIs. It's not like, like they can be vaccinated. So, so you, you see, it's, it's scary. And um, it, how nice it would be if more of the doctors in their offices trusted you enough to be able to give you that Zofran so, so that if you feel like your, your child is having that reaction, you can just take it over the counter while you call them. It's like, it's like EpiPen, right? Like if, if your child is having an IgE mid, a food, al uh, like food allergy, your doctor is going to prescribe EpiPen. Why yeah. not do something similar? Okay, right? Yeah, I agree. Just, just to decrease yeah, the stress. Just, and uh, even just advocating and trusting your gut too, like the, I think, you know, lots of times in the initial, first stages of, you know, FIs, they kind of just say, oh, you know, it's either a virus or whatever, like, and, you know, you, you kind of feel it as a parent that there's something going on, um, and just trying to push for what you know that there's, you know, that there's something going on, um, and it's kind of hard to do that with doctors sometimes. Yeah, I think, oh gosh. This is going to sound interesting, at least for me, but sometimes doctors can be intimidating. But I also have to tell you that sometimes as a physician, I get intimidated by my patients. Because, okay. because I'm under, so, so, so even though it might feel like you're, the doctor's intimidating, um, some of the doctors out there, you know, especially the ones who, who are in touch with the fact that we're, we're all human beings, first and foremost, regardless of our education, we're, we're all human beings. Um, sometimes they also realize that sometimes our patients can be our greatest teachers, right? That makes sense, yeah. Um, and especially if you come to it from a growth mindset and a, and a mindset of, of um, trying to understand and tr and trying to care, like like actually care about what happens to the to the people that you care for. Um, I think there's a lot of doctors. I, at least I hope that there's a lot of doctors who who really take pride in, in their heads that with great privilege, because it's such a privilege to see patients, um, that there also comes great responsibility, and that responsibility includes. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. And it's all about finding, uh, you know, the right uh, medical care provider to, um, you know, sometimes it takes going to a couple of different people. And then, you know, you find that one doctor who is like, oh, you know, I've heard of this or like, you know, becomes inspired and wants to become educated and they truly can make the biggest difference. You know, I think yeah. sometimes we just have to be patient as well. I know it's hard. Um, I'm currently practicing in New Jersey. If anyone is interested in New Jersey, I'm, I'm, I have my up, I, I, I do house calls, but I have my practice up and running so, to come to your house <laughs> and, 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 and if you need that because gosh, taking a child, a small child to the doctor and waiting there can be hard. And so why, why can't the doctor come to you? No. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think that's pretty much everything I have on my list of questions. Do you have anything else you wanted to talk about or mention? Um, so again, many books coming out this year. Please look for them. Um, I, I'm glad that we're going to have a little collaboration. We're going to work on the second, um, the second edition of the FI's book. My, another goal for me is to have a cookbook for all you guys. And I have a book that's coming out that's a Kickstarter about, um, I'm trying to do it as a Kickstarter because I want your input about babies with colic. So I read, okay, oh my that's... goodness. <laughs> I, I am hoping it's a book that's, that's re re revolutionary. Exciting. Yeah, because again, colic can also be stressful. Co co eventually babies who cry and cry and cry, they stop. But the impact that has on the family 
and the impact it has on the relationships can be profound, right? Oh, Wait, absolutely. When it's, you... it's such a, I couldn't even imagine not hearing some stories of some families with colic that yeah. it's, it's, you know, it, it shows you how strong people can be uh, to get through things like yeah, that. Yeah, or sometimes how you might be one way and then whoever is the father of the child or the mother of the child may be in a different way. And sometimes I can really pull you guys apart. Yeah. And then, then it's hard to feel alone. And so it's awesome when we all have each other. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Tight knit community. Yeah. That's, that's it. Like, this isn't about me. This is about us. This is about spreading the message and being like, this is, this is going to sound crazy, but being the, ch the change that we want to see in the world. Right. So be out there, talk about it, spread the awareness. Let's do something. Yeah, and I appreciate everything you're doing, even just doing this live with me. Um, you know, I, I just, it's amazing just to talk to someone about FPIs who's been there and who knows, you know, and um, I think that just going through the journey was probably one of the hardest things, even mentally just for myself. Yeah. And I think we don't talk about that enough either, right? The, the impact on the parents. Like I, from watching your kids struggle so much and from the just the stress of food trials and not knowing what's going to happen, it's nice to know that, you know, there are doctors and other people who are going through the same thing, um, you know, just to, to feel included. That's the thing. Like we're... We're all in this together. We're all a community. I think we live in a culture of lo loneliness where we might not necessarily be alone, right? Because we, we have our children, so we're not alone, but we can feel lonely or we can feel disconnected from each other. And by having our groups, and by like you doing your 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 whole page and your advocacy at work as well, what we're doing is we're bringing each other together. And I urge the people who've had children with FPIs to then be out there in the community, spreading their message, saying it's going to be okay. And because sometimes when you're in the trenches of it, you get so scared or so overwhelmed or so into the, your feelings. That's hard to be out there and, and, and sharing your story and, and sharing all your vulnerability. And it's nice when somebody Absolutely. allows you, gives you that safe space to, to share it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think that's, that's really helpful for sure. Yeah. Any other questions? No, that's all I have for you. Uh, <laughs> of course. Yeah. We can do this at any time, truly. Um, yes, we'll definitely have to do this again. Uh, and I agree. We, absolutely. Let's do this again. Uh, maybe when we when we launch our, our version number two of the book. And then um, I just, I'm, I'm grateful for all of you. And, and thank you for listening. Sounds good. And yeah, I'm grateful too. I'm grateful for this. And for all <laughs> followers who are watching. And